Hello. This presentation is the first in a series exploring the standardization of the English language. This is a hugely important process in the history of English, not only because of the effects it had on the, the form of the language, but also, and probably even more importantly, because of the effects it had and the effects it continues to have on the way that we think about language. In this presentation, I attempt to frame the key issues by sketching some preliminary issues related to the notion of a standard English. I want to begin by considering some commonplace assumptions that we tend to make about our language today. First is the idea that every word has a single correct spelling. I think if you, if you think about this and spelling variation, you might be able to come up with some examples of words that you know have multiple spellings. Probably you might think of some examples like this, right? Color and color and center and, and gray and so forth. But we recognize these as, as differences between American English and British English, right? So there's a whole series, we'll talk about this later on in the semester, of spelling differences between standard British English and standard American English. But really, those are um, not really exceptions to this rule. They just sort of highlight the need to distinguish uh, what is correct spelling in American English versus what is correct spelling in, in British English. A bit more challenging, perhaps, are cases like, like this, like donut and through, right? Uh, we might encounter both of these spellings in American English. Still, I'm not sure that both are regarded as correct. I know um, if you spend enough time on the internet or in English departments, you can see that people often complain about the spelling of donut, D-O-N-U-T. Um, think of it as incorrect as opposed to the, the longer one there. So I think that even these are examples that, that show that there is an idea that one of those is correct. <coughs> Another assumption that we have relates to how words are pronounced, right? The idea that there's a single correct pronunciation. Here too, I think you might think of some uh, exceptions right away. Um, these exceptions might include those, those words that are different in American English versus British English, right? So you know about words like schedule versus schedule or past versus post or garage or versus garage or something like that. Right. So those are, again, a difference between what's correct in American English versus what's correct in British English. They're not really exceptions to this rule. And of course, you're also aware of variant pronunciation for words like creek and coupon and, and pecan or pecan and coupon and coupon and creek and crick, of course, things like that. But with these, I think it's true that people tend to believe that one pronunciation is better. That is, one pronunciation is more correct um, than the other one is, right? Um, even though in some cases their judgment about which one is the correct one may, may differ from someone else's judgment. They still have this idea that one of them is correct. Words like either, neither, route, um, and their variant pronunciations, either and neither and, and root. Those are probably stronger candidates for being counterexamples. I think people tend not to view these in terms of a uh, correct versus incorrect um, framing. So these might be um, good candidates for exceptions to this rule. But nevertheless, generally speaking, we do think of words as having a single correct pronunciation. When it comes to grammar, I think the case is a little bit clearer. Some usages are correct and others are incorrect. Right? I'm sure you can all think of examples of things that would be readily considered grammatically incorrect. And we'll actually be looking at some examples in just a minute. Finally, there is the assumption that any uncertainties about these uh, matters of correctness, that those uncertainties can be resolved by consulting authorities. Right? Think, for example, what you would do if you were unsure about how to spell or how to pronounce a word. Well, you might look it up at a dictionary or you know, Google it, and that'll give you a kind of dictionary information. The broader implication here is that native speakers are not seen as authorities on their own language, right? There's always someone or some book that knows English better than you, and so you should just trust those sources more than you should trust your own mind, your own 
internal grammar of the English language. Right? So in a way, um, the standardization of English is a centuries-long scheme for gaslighting native speakers of the language. And we'll have more to say in that vein in a later presentation. The key point is that despite the fact that these assumptions today all seem perfectly reasonable um, and they're just comments on, on the way that English is today, right? it's important to remember that they are all recent developments. None of these statements applied in the Middle English period, for example. They've come to be how English works only within the last few centuries. The way that we got to where we are today with those assumptions about English taken to be true, uh, that is through the process of standardization. This process has had a tremendous effect on the language itself as well as on how we conceive of language, um, how we think about languages and the English language, um, how those work in general. Standardization is a process and the outcome of that process is this thing that we call standard English. So it's good to take a second and reflect on just what we mean by this label. Standard English often goes by other um, labels, right? We might talk about it as proper English or correct English or good English or in some context, the Queen's English. Um, right? All of these are uh, sort of synonyms for the, the term standard English, right? And of course, they also, many of them, um, bring with them an implication of something that's not standard English, right? So if it's not proper English, it's improper. If it's not correct, it's incorrect. And if it's not good, it's bad. One of the funny things about standard English <coughs> is that it's, it's hard to define in a positive sense. That is, it, it's a challenge to list all the forms and usages that constitute this thing that we think of as standard English. It's actually much easier to define standard English in terms of what it's not. That is by thinking about which usages it excludes. And we'll look at some examples of that. Um, take, for example, this sentence, we ain't seen nobody, no problem. Every speaker um, educated in the United States, at least, would immediately recognize this as, as not standard English, right? A word like ain't, in fact, does all the work here. Um, it immediately qualifies a sentence as non-standard, though I think it's important to to note that this wasn't always the case, right? Ain't hasn't always had this terrible reputation. It's something that's developed really in the last hundred years or so, but that's a story for another time. Similarly, a usage like me and Tim in this sentence, me and Tim are working together, when it's used as a subject, that's another form that immediately moves a sentence into the non-standard column. And here, a sentence like we was talking all night, given our obsession over subject verb agreement, which, as we've noted earlier, is kind of ironic, considering how little of this kind of agreement we actually have in modern English. Um, it's, it's no surprise that this kind of violation, we, plural, plus was, singular, uh, that that marks a sentence as non-standard. Right. So, th so these are the kinds of things, uh, these examples that I've just gone through, are the kinds of things I have in mind when suggesting when I suggest that standard English is easier to define by what it isn't than what it is, right? These usages are not accepted as part of standard English, so we readily judge someone who uses them as not speaking or not writing in standard English. It's important as a kind of caveat to note that s uh, when we talk about standard English, we're not talking about what is the most common form of English, right? The things that we consider to be standard English are not necessarily the most frequently used alternatives. Right? Standard English is definitely not determined by popular vote. Consider this example, right? That is the shelf on which I keep my trophies versus that's the shelf I keep my trophies on, right? The first variant is the one that follows the rules of standard English avoiding that terrible, terrible sin of ending the sentence with a preposition. But I think you'll agree that the second one is certainly uh, the one that would be more, f more frequently encountered. Same story here. Standard English calls for whom in a sentence like this. Whom are you going to call? But certainly who, as in who you're going to call, 
would be the more common usage. <coughs> These examples also highlight a fact that perhaps should be obvious, and that is if you actually followed the prescribed rules of standard English all the time, if you went around using whom and saying things like the shelf on which I store my trophies, you would probably sound ridiculous. So what do we mean by standard English? Well, we can define it in somewhat loose terms um, in this way. We can think of it as the form of English that's found in formal writing, that is certainly in, in most kinds of academic writing and in legal context and government usage and so forth. It's also, in principle, I say, a non-regional form. That is, standard English in, um, in one part of the country should be standard English in another part of the country. The complication there is that th I say in principle because that, that's generally true for the grammatical forms, um, but we, in at least in the case of American English, allow much more variation in terms of pronunciation across regions. But in principle, it's a kind of non-regional form, right? If someone is speaking standard English, you don't know which part of the country they're from necessarily. And then uh, probably most important for many of you, it is the form that is explicitly taught in schools. <coughs> schools serve a huge function in the promotion uh, of standard English. And it's important to note here, I say explicitly taught, nobody is a native speaker of formal standard English, right? Everyone has to learn these rules because these rules are not a, a normal part of, of English. Um, and so they have to be explicitly taught. And schools are one mechanism for teaching people this form of English. By way of further context for understanding just exactly what standard English is, we might consider this question, right? Can a, can a language get along without a standard form? Is a standard language really necessary? And the answer um, is very clear here that standard languages are not at all necessary. Consider, for example, the fact that the majority of the world's languages, right, there are something like 6,000 languages spoken in the world today, most of them do not have a standardized variety. They do not have a form that has undergone this process of standardization um, that we'll be uh, detailing in just a few minutes. Right? Furthermore, even in the case of English, English did not have this standardized form until the early modern period. Right In the medieval period, there was no clear thing that we could point to and say, this is standard English. So obviously, um, standard languages are not necessary. Lots and lots of languages get by just fine without having something that they recognize as the standard variety, the standard dialect. Furthermore, it's important to understand that standard languages, by which we mean those varieties, those dialects that have been taken to be the standard form, right? that, that they do arise, um, they do, sorry, they do not arise naturally. They are consciously created by people, and these people, of course, have vested interests in maintaining certain uh, levels of control and power over others. It's a point we'll get to later. Right? The whole idea of a standard language stands in the way of natural language development. Left to their own devices, languages change, they adapt over time, they develop variant forms. Right? They have to meet the different needs of, of their populations who speak them, and there's a lots of different kinds of communication. Standardization attempts to fix a language in place and in time. It attempts to prevent it from changing and to, to rein in all this useful variation. So in this sense, standardization is an unnatural process applied to a language. So why do languages get standardized? process typically arises in particular kinds of societies at particular historical moments. In the, in the reading you did, setting the stage for this early modern period, um, in contrast to the earlier medieval period, I think you got a sense of some of the things that were going on to drive this process of standardization. Uh, Caxton offers a useful contemporary comment in this regard. You might remember Caxton is the guy who was the first English printer. He's the one who 
brought the printing press to London in 1476. Um, in one of the works that he printed in 1490, he offers these comments which usefully frame the problem uh, with English that he saw at the time. Right? He writes, I'll just read it with a modern or present day English pronunciation. Uh, and certainly our language now used varies far from that which was used and spoken when I was born. Right? It's kind of a classic, kids today really have changed things. Um, and he goes on, and that common English that is spoken in one shire varies from another, right? So he's noting there is regional differences across different parts of England. He goes on to illustrate this difficulty that he sees with regard to variation across dialects. He offers this little, this little story. Again, I'll, I'll read this in sort of present-day English translation here. In my days, it happened that certain merchants were in a ship in times for to have sailed over the sea into Zealand. Zealand is in, uh, in Europe. And for lack of wind, they tarried at Forland, that's in, in England, and went to land for to refresh themselves. And one of them, named Sheffield, a mercer, so he's from the middle part of England, came into the house and he asked for meat, or rather he asked for meat, uh, for something to eat, that is. And especially he asked after eggs. And the good wife, the good woman there, answered uh, that she could speak no French. And the merchant was angry, for he could also speak no French, um, but would have had eggs. And she understood him not. And then at last another said that he would have iron. Then the good wife said that she understood him well. And Caxton concludes, Lo, what should a man in these da days now write, eggs or iron? Certainly it is hard to please every man by cause of diversity and change of language. Right, so you can see the problem here. Uh, in some dialects of English, they use the, w the, the plural eggs, and in other dialects, they use the plural erin. Right, that eggs, you might remember, um, is actually a form borrowed from Old Norse. So that would have been more common in uh, the northern parts of England. Um, and then the uh, southern forms of English uh, would use something closer to erin, Right. The point is you have this uh, variation in pronunciation, it causes a communication breakdown, and uh, it prevents people from storming into someone's house and demanding they be fed. And so that's obviously a problem that must be solved uh, by standardizing the language. Let's turn our attention from why the need for a standard was felt to how to actually accomplish that. Right, let's keep in mind the situation prior to standardization. Um, as we saw in Middle English, there's tremendous regional variation across dialects and pronunciation, in vocabulary, and in grammar. That's always been the case and continues to be the case today. But what's different in the period of Middle English is that there was not a dominant form, right? All dialects were on a kind of equal footing. And um, whichever one uh, an author chose to write in was fine, right? They all could use their local forms of English. And this is the diversity that Caxton was complaining about. So how do you get from that situation to the one we have now with one dialect held to be the standard and the others as non-standard? Linguists have identified several steps in the process of standardization. The first is known as selection, right, which is essentially choosing a variety or a dialect to become the standard variety. Naturally, this raises an important question of, well, how do you make that choice, right? What are the criteria that you use for determining that something should be standard, right? Look at these examples. How do you decide whether the verb should be ask or acts? How do you decide whether the third person singular of a verb should be tells or telleth, right? These are real examples of variation at the time. Um, and if you're going to have a standard, you have to decide that one is correct, one is standard, and the others are non-standard. We might think the reasonable thing to do would be to choose for your standard those forms that represent the most widespread ones, right? Decide by some kind of majority rules approach. Um, that's definitely not what happened in the case of English, right? Instead, the forms that won out tended to be those that were used by the people in power. I know that's shocking, but um, nevertheless, that's what happened. Generally speaking, it was the forms associated with the East Midlands dialect from the Middle English period, 
Um, that's the form that was used by people in Oxford and Cambridge, right, the academic centers, as well as by the upper classes in London, right? So those are the, those are the forms that won out, the forms that were associated with that part of society. The second step is getting everyone on board, right? Getting everyone to accept this form of English as the standard and getting them to use it. Here, the question that people might rightly ask is, you know, why should I give up my native dialect in order to adopt this new one that you're saying is, is standard, right? And the key to motiv people, motivating people to make this change is really twofold. You need to build up the standard and you need to bring down the other dialects. So how do you do this? Well, um, using the new standard as the language of authority, right? Using it in uh, government, um, printing laws and so forth, using it in the press, right? All of that would give it a kind of cachet that would sort of promote its um, prestige, right? On the other hand, to lower the status of other dialects, you might attempt to stigmatize them. You might for example, suggest that they're used only by undesirable people. So you could accomplish this in, say, plays and books by putting those dialects in the mouths of, of unlikable characters, right? If you have someone who's dumb or a country bumpkin or a criminal, you make them speak a dialect um, that you want people to see as, uh, a, as undesirable as a non-standard form. And of course, we still do this today, right? Take a look at almost any Disney movie that's ever been made and think about how the good guys talk versus how the bad guys talk. The next step is elaboration. Um, and here the idea is that you need to standardize, you need a standard language, so you need to standardize the language in order to have it function in a range of communication contexts, right? So it needs to be built up in order to do this, right? You need to make the standard work for all functions. And we can see how this applies in the case of standard English by recalling what the situation was in the Middle English period, right? Then English functioned as the main spoken language, right? The vast majority of the population spoke English um, every day uh, for all their needs. But it was used as um, just as a variety for these kinds of everyday conversational needs. It wasn't used to meet every need that people might have. The language of government, for example, the language of the courts, uh, that was French. The language of scholarship, the language of the church, that was Latin. So now, if you're going to use English to write laws or scientific papers, you're going to need to elaborate it. Right? Most obviously, you're going to need some vocabulary, right? because if you haven't been discussing things like highfalutin legal topics in English for centuries, you just don't have the words. right? So, um, as we'll see, um, later on, the main way that this problem was solved in the case of English was by borrowing thousands and thousands of words from French and Latin and Greek and other language. And that's all part of this stage of elaboration. Finally, there's this stage known as codification, right? This is when all the rules dictating what is and what isn't standard, how those rules are established. So decisions have to be made along those lines, and then those rules have to be publicized. Remember, this is a new creation. Nobody speaks standard English as their native tongue, so you need to have these rules laid out in dictionaries and grammar books so that people can learn them, and then eventually uh, so that people can uh, use them against, use that knowledge that they gain, use that against people who haven't learned those rules. So. Um, that's a kind of overview of the process of standardization and thinking about some of the basic definitions. Um, in uh, the presentations that follow, we'll be thinking about uh, this process in a little bit more detail, thinking about how exactly it was implementing, looking at some of the challenges that the people that were implementing these, this process, how, well, the challenges that they faced. And then we'll also spend some time discussing how it affects the way we think about English today. We'll see you later.